Today, we're going to give you two presentations talking about monitoring and, and measuring impact. One looking at, at an effort to do that at the scale of an organization. The other looking at an effort to do that across monitoring the impact of a suite of technologies. We hope this is important and valuable for you, not just because of the, these two different efforts, but because of how important monitoring and measuring impact is to us all. So my name is Jonathan Palmer. Uh, I am the Executive Director for Conservation Technology at WCS. As I believe many of you will have seen in the presentation this morning from our CEO, WCS works uh, in over 50 countries, protecting over 27 million square kilometers of pristine uh, highly uh, high land with high integrity. We, we have over 3,000 staff, 90% of which are local hires, and we work with over 200 indigenous communities and over 1,000 communities. And we do this with a focus on protecting nature's strongholds. These are areas where nature is strong, and nature is both valuable for the communities in and around those areas. The, the world today is facing an, an unprecedented bo bottleneck of challenges. Biodiversity loss, climate change, and, and zoonotic pa pandemics are, are three of the biggest challenges to humanity, and they're a threat to the existence of, of life on Earth as we know it. At the same time, we at WCS believe that the global recovery of nature is possible, not guaranteed, but is possible within a lifetime of a child born today. We believe that by pulling together as, as conservationists, we can, so I need my glasses. <laughs> get, I'm, get, I'm getting used to wearing glasses. <laughs> um, you know, that we believe we can live in a world where populations are stable or declining, where the majority of people are out of poverty. In the last 30 years, we've gone from 30% of the world to 10% of the world living in poverty. And that trend, supported by increased urbanization, we believe will continue. And importantly for conservation, we believe that we will get to a world where the, the, the population of the world is fed using a fraction of the resources we do today and with a shared environmental ethic. Now, monitoring impact is, is critical for our success. What, why is it important? One, it lets us know whether we've, we've achieved our objectives. It helps us identify what challenges we are facing and how to accommodate our strategies and approaches. It helps us to adapt to changing external conditions. It helps us improve our accountability internally to ourselves and to our, our partners and donors. It helps us demonstrate value and it promotes continuous learning and improvement for any organization. So how does WCS measure impact at the different scales at which we work? We have two main approaches. One is we ensure programs, empower programs to monitor their impact. And secondly, we, we look at aggregating that data and bringing in other data to measure our impact at scale. So solutions such as Smart, EarthRanger, and many other of the field tools that we've partnered with others to develop over the last 10 years are critical for us in measuring our impact on the ground. But they, all of these tools share one thing in common. They all allow data with, with permission to be aggregated up and allow us to tell the story of our impact at scale. So at an institutional level, we have a, a metrics working group that has developed about 60 different metrics that we're beginning to measure across these 10 or so areas. And we've built those into a, an impact platform. I welcome you after this talk to visit impact.wcs.org, which is an online platform built to share our, our impact with our constituents. The impact platform has three main goals. One, it is to help us as an organization critically evaluate our own, own impact, hold ourselves to account, check we really are doing what we believe we, we, we said we would do, and help us improve what we're doing. Secondly, we're building it out as a gateway to all the information and knowledge we generate across those 80 plus strongholds in which we work, across all the work of our 3,000 plus staff, we're working to ensure all the data we generate is linked from this impact platform. And then thirdly, as you'll see in a second, we've built it as a tool to communicate the depth and breadth of our impact. The impact platform includes a, a, a rich map and, and a dashboard for every place where we work, we include background information, information about our impacts, the species we work on, the nearby strongholds, and the themes we're working on. We include information about staff, publications, reports about the species we work on, 
and we include metrics of our impact, such as species trends, the, the percentage of the area where, which is secured and protected, and measures of, of livelihoods. We also allow, the platform allows you to explore WCS through what we call multiple lenses. And so you'll, you can look at our impact at a stronghold, a place, on a species, at a country level, at a regional level, or through a thematic lens, such as rights and communities. So let me give you a, a brief demo of our platform. I hope the connectivity is good enough here. So uh, the page is it's not sharing. From the AV side, is there someone who can help me share? If it's going to take time, we'll, we'll have to skip it. I, I need, uh, yeah, is there, is there a way of getting the, um, you'll do your best. Okay, what I, I want to share this on, this on there. And it's not part of your slide deck? No. Okay. Um, no. Oh, I see, is that? Ah, uh, there we go. Cool. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um, so here's a landing page for, for our impact platform. It gives you an overview of all the places we work, and you can explore using the map, or you can go in and choose any location. For example, let's go to New Bali and Doki in Congo. As illustrated earlier, the platform on the left-hand side provides background information, details about our impacts, high-level metrics, information about the species, uh, uh, News reports, publications, and, and videos. It includes information on all the species we're working with, and it includes information ab about coming from, from our metrics database. And so if someone's really interested in communities, we can see what's happening with the, the communities in, in, in different areas within that stronghold. Or if they're interested in species, they can look at the species richness or species trends for different species. And as mentioned, the platform also allows you to go in, and if you're interested in looking at what's happening, say, not at a uh, site level, or, but at a continental level, you can do that. Let me get back. And you can also go in, if you're interested um, in looking, let's go here, at a species. So here, instead of looking through the landscape of a individual stronghold, I'm looking through the landscape at lens of a, a species. I can see the places we work uh, I can go in and see the, the different trends we have for different locations on there. So, let's see if I can get this right this time. Cool. Um, there we go. That was a, yeah, so that was a brief demo of our impact platform. I think we'll, we'll return to this at the end, but hopefully it, it shows uh, what we think was a really exciting initiative in, in WCS, to, to take the data that's been collected in tools like Wildlife Insights, uh, like Smart, uh, like a number of the platforms we, we work on, bring those together in a, in a very compelling way, share the impact of our work around the world. So with that, I'll hand over to Sophie to tell a, a different story here. Thank you, Jonathan. Can everybody hear me okay? Is this on? Not on. Hello? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so we are at the Technology Conference, and we're all here to achieve conservation outcomes through technology. So how do we assess that? This is only a very small part of what Jonathan was talking about, but for us in this room, for those at this conference, it's important. So I'm Sophie Maxwell. I'm from Connected Conservation Foundation, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, an impact assessment framework for conservation technologies. And so what you'll see today is very much a concept. It's in progress. It's a live project working with these fantastic people. Uh, so we're going to present where we are, and we're really keen to get on-the-ground feedback, inputs, so we can shape this going forward. Um, I'm joined by Kim from Sabi Sands, who has helped us apply this framework on the ground, and Swabir, 
from 51 Degrees, who uh, has brought his operational expertise to this. Um, and we were also uh, helped by Conservation Alpha and Chris Baracivi, who's an impact measurement expert. Uh, and we've had a consultation from many people around uh, the community, um, one of which is Earth Ranger and, and Jeff Lef uh, Lefcourt's input into this. So why are we doing this? Well, Connected Conservation works to bring together the resources of technology companies, donors, and local partners to equip protected areas with the tools they need for conservation. We provide digital infrastructure with our partners at the bottom of this slide. And to date, we've equipped 10 parks uh, with hardware and tools from landscape-wide connectivity to communications, to cameras, thermal cameras, sensors, as well as now satellite imagery. And so we have started to bring together the, the data from the remote areas into EarthRanger. And also CCF fundraises for the implementation of conservation technologies. So we've started to ask ourselves, really, how do we measure the effectiveness of these technologies? And this is really important to do without putting burden on the teams because they're already stretched resources in the field. So I stress, stress that we must do this without putting the burden. But there are so many tools now in the field, surveillance, ecological monitoring, verification. You know, our aim with this is really now to think about how we develop an easy to use technology impact assessment framework, offering protected area managers a set of repeatable indicators and tools that can be used to assess the impact of technology in conservation. So that we can have fit for purpose tools that surface the benefits and also one of the other objectives is really to help protected area managers build a business case. Just think about it, you're a protected area manager, you've got a whole suite of technologies, how do you know where to invest? What do you take to your board to say, oh, sh okay, we should invest in connectivity, or should we invest in a land cruiser? You know, both have an upfront cost, both have ongoing maintenance costs. Is a land cruiser going to cause um, more, well, sorry, is a land cruiser going to help with conservation outcomes more than connectivity? So how do we provide evidence for this? And you know, I have donors. Their dream would be to say that their particular technology has helped improve the management and effectiveness of protected areas by X percent. You know, our donors would love to have this. They'd love to say that their solution has uh, saved costs and time, improved detection of threats, reduced decision-making time, and increased collaboration. Is this possible, or is it a pipe dream? So we set about a consultative process, working with many experts from PA managers, security experts, IT consultants. We brought them all together in workshops to see and explore the art of the possible. Everyone recognized that we need a robust implement, implementation uh, measurement and impact monitoring framework. But we all also recognize that it is impossible to attribute a technology to a specific conservation outcome. It's fraught with practical challenges and statistical assumptions. Technology is only one part of a capability. Round it are people and other operational factors that we need to consider. We had a lot of IT consultants in the room from Dimension Data, so we asked them, how do they do this in the corporate sector? And actually, it's really common. You know, For measuring digital transformation in a corporate environment, then you have KPIs to measure how technologies are improving your operations, how technologies are improving and bringing new capabilities, and ultimately what changes they're making to the costs and the bottom line. So we all agreed that technology can be measured to achieve management effectiveness and operational outcome and improvement of capabilities. So what we did was we started on a taxonomy. We looked at all the different outcomes that we wanted the technology to achieve, we group them into categories, we put the types of technologies against those categories, and we brainstormed example indicators for what we would like to measure against that technology to achieve that outcome. And we put them all in a lovely colored wheel here, which is very nice, uh, and into three groups. So I'm just gonna take you for a bit of a spin of the wheel. I hope you don't feel sick. 
uh, let's go for the first section, which is improved operational effectiveness. So a valued conservation technology is successful uh, if through their implementation it achieves one of these aims. The first one is improved management and protection. And so in that we had uh, indicators such as detection of threats, reduced time for decision making and action, precision of information for decision and clear instruction, and increased predictive capabilities. Logistical feasibility. How does the technology improve the range of operations for that ranger unit or that team and improve their work capacity? And then each protected area has its own objectives. They might want to improve their tourism product. They might want to have better beneficiation, beneficiation for communities. So against those PA objectives, how is that technology improving against it? The next section was reduced risk, and this is something we have borrowed from the IT sector and actually translates very well to um, the protected area management side. And this is about reduced risk, firstly to stakeholders. So how does increased ac accountability through technology, increased ethical responsibility and transparency? So then technology can help also reduce operational uh, risk. So that's the bottom one for increasing safety to staff increasing safety to assets, and technology can also reduce organizational risk for security, from hacking or cybersecurity, and, and making sure they're adhering to privacy and compliance. So there are lots of benefits here to technology. And then a value technology improves, must improve cost effectiveness. So how does it save time and effort of those rangers, reducing the man hours for management or training? How does it reduce operating costs through maintenance, breakages, and running costs? And how is it cheap enough up front through reduced capital costs and with a long service life to be valuable? There was a lot of indicators there that I've just talked you through, and uh, we needed to simplify it. So rather than take a top-down approach, we decided to get busy, get testing it on the field, and see what would work and what didn't, and build it up from there with a test and learn approach. So we had fantastic help from Kim and Endry Stern, and sadly Endry can't be here today, but he has had a huge amount of input into this process, um, and uh, really helped us craft how we move forward. So we were running a PNC at the moment. This is a live project where we've taken the first set of three indicators from improved management and protection and to see if we could make what's possible. So a smaller subset and parked all the other indicators for now. We're trialing this in Sabi Sands. We've worked with Sabi Sand for uh, over five years now. And with Connected Conservation, we've put in advanced technologies. We've put in connectivity, cameras, and this has really been rolled out at scale. It's a fence reserved, uh, so the reserve uh, has a security focus on preventing rhino poaching, so we're applying it in this context. And because we've worked with Sabi Sands for a long time, they've kept a detailed catalog of what technologies have been deployed over the years and how this has advanced and when they are functioning. So we have activity reports for the technology itself and its function. And Sabi have been trying to record incident data for quite some time with different methods, different spreadsheets. So we're lucky that the incident data is available. Um, and this has enabled a, a retrospective review. So what we've done is looked at a methodology of taking incident reports and looking at the role of technology within the OODA loop process. So I'm sure most of the people in this room are familiar with this management response approach. And what we wanted to do is how the technology helps with the observation, provides precision and accurate and timely information for orientating the situation, the situational awareness to make the decision, clear instruction on the course of action, so that then the intervention is effective and there comes an outcome through the whole observe to action sequence. So with any monitoring and evaluation approach, you need to have a baseline and you need to compare against a baseline to see the change. We would love to have a baseline for this trial, but sadly because we have evolved technology over the time, we don't have a specific point in time that we can compare to. Ideally, in the future, what we would do is run a baseline survey before the technology system went in and then run that survey again at the end. But for this particular proof of concept, we all agreed that it would be uh, the best case if we 
compared to a situation without technology. And we have people in the field, such as Endry, who's been there for a very long time. He remembers what it was like without technology, how incidents might play out, and how um, uh, the, the OODA loops might have performed without the tools that they have today. So, we created a spreadsheet to get busy and start measuring it all. Uh, and this aligns with EarthRanger. So in EarthRanger, you can gen generate an action sequence of an incident that has an incident number, it has times against it, and you can actually then output that. So in the future, it would be wonderful to automate this so that when you have a particular bit of data coming in from a technology, we have a drop down, and that technology is actually reported in line with that action. So then we can have the action sequence, the technology, and then we can start to grade the performance of that technology in that particular section. So for now, we've done this all very manually. Um, but really, what we would uh, recommend is a grading system behind here. And we've worked with Swabir on this spreadsheet. So Swabir has been instrumental in putting this together and putting the grading system together, where we can actually give points to the technology for its performance in that action sequence. So it might be the detection. For timeliness, we would have the information relay, so how the information has come from the remote area into the ops room. Did it come through in one to five minutes? Did it come through into 15 to 30 minutes? You know, then we can say that that was excellent, good, and each one of those has points against it. Precision, so for precision, was that information that came through quality? Did it enable clear instruction? So for example, a fence sensor. Some fence sensors give you an indication if there's been tampering with the fence within a five kilometer region. Other fence sensors give it to you for one kilometer region. So you could say that the one kilometer had more precision because you were able to go to the exact site of the tampering, where the five kilometer, yes, you got a detection, but the precision was rated lower. So all of that can then be attributed to an area in the OODA loop and then given a capability score. And then Jess actually pointed out, you know, you have, um, Jess from EarthRanger, technology seldom operates on its own in, in a vacuum. You know, there are enablers within the technology. So, for example, the incident we're just going to talk you through was actually triggered by one of WPS's camera traps. Give away, Varric. <laughs> So the first observation was made by WPS. They were the enabler. That was also enabled by EarthRanger because the data came through to EarthRanger. So we need to recognize that enabling technology as well. All of that then gives scores to EarthRanger and WPS's tool as well. So we've done this for one incident, which Kim's going to talk you through now, but we've done it uh, for others as well. So we're up to about four incidents, but we would like to do it for a whole year of Sabi San. So Kim, can you come and present the next slide? Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, before I carry on, just thank you for everything that you've done for the Sabi Sands. Um, I think we've, you know, you guys have enabled us a whole lot more than, than uh, you know, what we just had before, before all this technology. Um, so yeah, thank you for all the partnerships over the years. Um, it's really helped us. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna take you through a, a video. It's basically just what we've put together of one of our most recent post poaching incidents. Um, as Sophie mentioned, it started off with the trap camera image which came into our ops room. Um, so it's, it plays automatically, right? Yes. Okay, so you'll see there's the trap camera image. Uh, we immediately then deployed our reaction team and our anti-poaching unit to the, to the area. Um, all of this is used using LoRa trackers and radio trackers as well as vehicle trackers as well. So all of that gets uh, pulled into EarthRanger. Our reaction team as well, uh, they also carry LoRa devices with them. has got a drone uh, supporting it as well. We had a, a fixed wing coming in to help us with uh, detecting any possible carcasses. Um, then our fence team as well, they picked up on a possible entry exit location. Our reaction team then went over to that. So you can see there's, there's a few OODA loops going on at, at the same time. Um, some teams are following up on the spur, some teams are following up on the entry exit and any tracks found outside. 
Um, so you'll see as it goes along um, how the teams get together and uh, you know react to different to different situations. Um, and then obviously our reaction team then joined up with our canine unit to help them with the follow-up uh, to backtrack the guys tracks to see where they had come from um, because the trap camera image displayed that they were actually on their way out of the reserve. Um, our neighboring APUs, so we've got uh, external contracted APUs in our reserve. Um, so you'll see on the, on the right hand side is one of the APUs checking their, their western boundary to see if the poachers had crossed over into their area. Uh, the fixed wing then picked up on a, a possible carcass. Our canine unit was deployed there with the drone technology to go and confirm the carcass. Um, they then went back after the carcass was confirmed and reported to the authorities. Um, they then went back to the spur to try and locate other uh, evidence where they found more spur, they found a possible shooting location, um, and that was basically the oodle loop of how we came to find the carcass. Um, I think it's just uh, starting again. Um, and then, yeah, so the, basically it's taking this whole incident and putting it into, uh, like Sophie said, we, we're comparing it with, with technology and without technology. So how would it have impacted us if we didn't have the, to the technology? Um, and we found that with technology, uh, we were able to confirm a carcass before the horns were removed. Unfortunately, the, we did lose the rhino, but at least the poachers were not successful in the incident. They didn't get the horns from the rhino. Um, and basically, like I said, with the drone, it helped us to keep our team safe as well as to confirm carcasses. Um, and then basically we had new intelligence coming, coming in. Um, so we used this technology and the tracking, um, which showed quite suspicious activity within our internal staff members. And uh, we found out that uh, two of our fence guys, fence rangers, as well as one of our gate staff were involved in, in, the, in the incident. And it's all with technology that we were able to find this out. If we didn't have the technology, it's possible that they could still be in the reserve and they could be planning more poaching incidents. Um, so it's very important that we were able to pick them up and get, get them out of the reserve. Uh, with the help of our deception policy as well. Um, then with the field intelligence that we've gathered over the years, we were able to basically plan where the trap camera was deployed um, based on historical exit routes and entry routes and uh, you know the normal routes that they follow throughout the reserve. And um, yeah, so this is a perfect example of using that technology and correctly deploying our trap cameras and uh, this is what picked up the the poachers and um, unfortunately we were not able to arrest any of them uh, but the, the fact remains if we didn't have that trap camera image we wouldn't even even have known that they were inside the reserve and we would have only found the rhino carcass maybe days late later uh, once we had noticed vul vulture activity or something like that um, so yeah the, the technology has really helped us in improving our detection capabilities. And Sophie will go into more detail about the timing. Um, but yeah, we've found that technology may not necessarily improve our time, but definitely our, our efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for all your work on this. It's been brilliant to get your input. And as I mentioned, this is a concept. So please, you know, be kind with the data because we are just working this out as a theoretical approach right now. Um, we've done this for other scenarios, as I mentioned, and each one we've generated a video in Earth Ranger. In Earth Ranger, you have a time slider uh, and it goes across. So you can then output the replay of an incident and how that might help with future adaptation and management for analysis and improvements in the future. We were interested in doing that. We've done that for four incidents now just to see if it was data overload. You know, does it actually help when you've got all the tracks and everything going on or is it too much information? So we're still working on that at the moment. So now you can start to see then uh, about this concept and how it could ladder up into something that you might review over a year with your board and your team. 
So as the points aggregate for different scenarios, you can see how different technologies are becoming valuable in multiple instances over the years. To um, the radios, which are always super valuable, and it proves that they're involved in every incident, to the LoRa sensors for the fence, to other um, solutions. But what you need to remember is that we have to also compare this with what was live at the time and have an activity report. You know, if camera traps are down, they're not going to score very highly in scenario one. So you need to make sure that you've got that in place. And then human with binoculars, not all incidences are going to use technology. You might have five incidences over the year that didn't use any technology at all. You've got all this sophisticated equipment, but actually that we didn't need it. So uh, this, it might be very valuable for everybody to understand that. We're all here to get conservation outcomes. Um, and then the enablers. How often was that and Laura Network used? How often was EarthRanger used? Was a report generated from EarthRanger? Was a report generated from SMART after the incident? You know, we can start to look at this. And all of this, you can see then, would build a business case for the board to say, okay, Thermal cameras in Sabi, for Sabi Sands, for their context and their situation, they're super valuable. Let's invest in more of them. Let's invest in maintaining them and because they are a valued piece of the solution. So um, then I think you know, all of these calculations, Sabir and I are working on the grading and we've, we've had a really good go at that um, and I think we'll improve it over time. So Sabir, would you like to add anything in terms of, um, yeah? OK, cool. So our findings so far, um, really interesting. You know, military, they will tell you that OODA loop actually decreases the time of the incident and the time to respond. Or, well, that was what I expected. I expected a decrease in the incident length. Actually, it increased the incident length. So with technology, the incident was 12 hours. Without technology, the incident was only 50 minutes. The incident without technology had two loops. The incident with technology had six loops, all happening simultaneously. But the depth of intelligence that was gathered far outweighed what was uh, gathered with, without technology versus what with technology. So with technology, you can really get depth of intelligence that leads to deeper conservation outcomes. So there's still lots of work to do. We think we're on to something, and we think, you know, Sabi Sands have said that they these outputs would be valuable for them to present to stakeholders, to present over time, to build that business case for future technologies. Um, and that we really you know, feel like standardized grazing could, grading could be possible here. Um, the burden is inputting the data, so we need to work with EarthRanger to minimize and automate as much as possible. Okay, I think, oh, just on to next steps. Um, we're going to continue working with Sabi Sands, putting in data for the whole year and see where we get to. We would love data from other field partners. So, okay, this is a security context that we're working in. We would love, you know, management response can be for human wildlife conflict. It can be from wildlife health. You know, you're using trackers, you're using other detection tools. So how does those tools help you in those contexts? And we'd love to work with new partners who have the data so that we can we can um, increase our, our uh, survey here. You know, we need a good sample size. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Yeah, it's a really good question, Eric, and please keep all these questions coming because this is helping us think and improve. Um, we have got an indicator on range of operations within the logistical feasibility. So a camera trap, smaller range, thermal camera, bigger range, higher cost. 
So how does that net out against the uh, cost effectiveness and the improvements. So we've only looked at three indicators. We did park range of operations and logistical feasibility for now, but we would love to come back to that and, and then start weighing that up within the model. There was another two spreadsheets that were m way more complex than this um, when we first started. And it went down to the resolution of the camera and you know how it can detect, the length and range of detection and all of that. And we just looked at it and thought, that is so complicated. Um, we have to dial it back. So we've gone for detection at the front end, the observation, whatever that is, whether it's a, a ranger with binoculars, whether it's a camera, whether it's a, a bush cam, whether it's a IR as a detection at this, at this stage, without going into those more technical details about the, the camera's capabilities. It's just a camera, a drone, a person detecting how long did that detection take to be transmitted. So we're just going for that baseline um, capability at this moment in time. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, just to build on that point so a bit, I think those metrics really come in at the end of the year as well when you start to look at over 10 scenarios, 20 scenarios what are the models that allow you to say within 20 scenarios camera traps have been effective at x percent versus the cost which camera traps and then you know you can start to model out the impact of, of those tools uh, rather than on an individual scenario Yeah, of course, this is new. We haven't done it before, so we are trying our best to, to really kind of um, trailblaze here. <laughs> yeah, any thoughts? Feedback? Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's just finish it off then. You know, again, thank you all for, for coming uh, to this last uh, open session for the for the conference, and hopefully we'll all see each other in the in the keynote. Um, you know, we presented two different approaches to monitoring impact, two different aspects. One monitoring at a at a global scale uh, for a conservation organisation, and one at a project scale for evaluating technologies. We hope uh, they, they they both emphasise how important it is to monitor our impact, and we we hope that as we move together as a community, a conservation community, we increasingly double down on our skills not only to produce great tools, but to, to monitor the impact of those tools and ensure those tools help demonstrate the impact of the organizations we work with. So thank you all.